it's so nice to see so many of our uh, friends from the far country returning. It's so nice to see newcomers in our midst and, and for us to find meaning and purpose in our gathering together. And that is our hope, that you might find the love of Christ at the center of our experience. Let me remind you, or for some of you, inform you for the first time, about a series that we've been uh, going through called Believe. Think, act, and be like Jesus. For 10 weeks, we spent time thinking about, talking about what we think, what we believe, uh, affirmations of faith. And then for 10 weeks, we're spending time in right in the middle of this, talking about what we do, our spiritual practices as a result of what we believe. And then our final 10 weeks will be focused on who we are, our character, our virtues. What we think and what we do shapes who we are. That's the progression. And so... We began our, uh, our focus on what we do, our spiritual practices during Advent, and we stopped a couple weeks before Christmas. The first five were what we call vertical practices. Uh, worship, that's what we do with God. Prayer, what we do with God. Some of the practices that are vertical between us and God. Last week, we began the horizontal practices. We started talking about biblical community, who we are with one another. Today, we talk about spiritual gifts and how we exercise what God has given us in our midst and in the world. We move from vertical to horizontal. No accident that it makes a cross. And so, today, we're looking at the theme of spiritual gifts. Something that's helpful for you to know in the context of what we're about to read from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that in the ancient world, the typical belief was among the pagan religions was that there were very select few people who were given special spiritual abilities, special dispensations, and they used those abilities in very flashy ways that the pantheon of gods only chose certain individuals for that kind of gifting, if you will. Then came Pentecost, the birth of the church, the giving of the Holy Spirit, and everything changed. Instead, there we see that spiritual gifts from God are shared among every Christ follower. If you are a Christ follower, spiritual gifts are given to you. Every single one of us, not just certain ones. And what we see happening is this great reversal in history of how we understand God and how God relates to us. Whereas it was the pantheon of gods giving just a few gifts, now it's one God giving every Christ follower gifts. You see how that works? It's an amazing reversal that is happening. And Paul is teaching about this. And the nature of these gifts, this is one among three sections in the scriptures that lists some of these gifts, and we're going to unpack these a little bit more. But hear what he has to say to us, and, and listen to what he's saying about the one God and the many gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your gifts. We thank you for your spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would come alive to us and in us and through us as never before. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reminded uh, this time of year, a lot of people are away on vacation or coming back from vacation. There was a pastor who was on vacation in England, and as many people do, he visited the Westminster Abbey. In, in being toured around by the tour guide, the tour guide noted all the catacombs, 
all of these burial tombs and all these great names and people. And the tour guide said to the pastor and the group that was with him, England's great are asleep in these walls. To which the pastor mustered under his breath, well, then I feel right at home. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting conclusion about the church, isn't it? Because the truth is a lot of people make conclusions about the church that are not so positive like that. And most of the not so positive conclusions are made by the majority of people who are not, in fact, in worship services like this. And what are they concluding? They're concluding things like the church is asleep. The church is dead. The church is irrelevant. The church is full of hypocrites. The church is judgmental. The church is a bless me club. And so on. It's a disturbing thing. I found something that's even more disturbing, actually. There's a song that's out. And it's actually Grammy-nominated number one song of the year. You'd think by the title, it's really positive for we who love the church as Christ followers. It's called Take Me to Church by a guy named Hosier, and he is apparently an Irish singer. But let me, let me share with you just some of the lyrics in this. Listen to this. It's very sobering. He says, My lover's got humor. She's the giggle at a funeral. Nobody knows everybody's disapproval. I should have worshipped her sooner. Every Sunday's getting more bleak, a fresh poison each week. We were born sick, you heard them say it. Take me to church. I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of your lies. I'll tell you my sins and you can sharpen your knife. All for me that deathless death. Good God, let me give you my life. That's a, that's a pretty negative assessment of the church, isn't it? Very tongue-in-cheek very negative. And do you know that my own daughter is sitting in the back seat among thousands and thousands of other teenagers singing this number one hit song, just not even thinking about the words and what it means. And it's a sobering reality. That conclusion and the conclusion of so many is not God's conclusion. It's not God's intention. It's not God's design for the church, what we were meant to be. God designed us to be a meaningful biblical community. Last week we talked about biblical community being marked by devotion to the apostles' teaching, that is, studying God's Word. Devotion to fellowship, that is, to one another, sharing our lives, living our lives, being integrated together. Devotion to breaking the bread, that is, the sacraments, and devotion to prayers, which is corporate worship. But that's a part of what marks us, God's design for us. God designed us to be light in darkness, a city on a hill. God designed us to be healers and hope givers. God designed us to be generous and just, merciful and grateful. God designed us to be inwardly strong and outwardly focused, not one or the other, but both. God designed us to be selfless and filled with himself, his Holy Spirit. God designed the church to be overflowing with his grace as we receive it personally. God designed us to be equipped with God-given gifts to serve the church corporate and the world. That's God's design. That's God's intention. Your role, as, as much as we can narrow it down into a little thumbnail sketch, your role is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit for those purposes. You know what my role is? My role is to equip you. My role is to equip you. In fact, let me share with you what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 about a pastor. And this is very, very important to think about the distinction. So Christ himself, he says, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why did he give you pastors and teachers like me? He answers the question. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of of Christ. You see, I don't do ministry for you. You do ministry. I equip you. 
The deal is this. You have spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts to discover, to develop, and to deploy. My job is to help you, not to replace you. Not to do it for you. It's an important distinction. And, 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 and even more important is to know that it all begins in biblical community when we come together. We discern God's call here together as we work it out with one another. There's a great definition for calling. Frederick Beekner has this definition. It's, it's been well used and, and you might really like it. I do. He says, your calling is where your great passion and the world's great needs intersect. Your great passion and the world's great needs intersect. Isn't that a great way of thinking about it? But that takes discernment. That takes testing. That takes time with one another, getting feedback from one another. I can share with you an example of that in my life. I remember when I was in seminary, and I had to do an internship. And, and whereas I had worked in a lot of churches and suburban areas like our own, I thought I'd do something different. I was very interested in foreign missions, and so I went and worked in a church in Trinidad down in the West Indies in the Caribbean for three months. And I had so romanticized being in a foreign country and how cool it would be and the impact I could make and, you know, just learning in that setting. But then, as I engaged in ministry there, four worship services every Sunday morning, it was tiring. <laughs> and I began to realize, getting feedback from them, that I was being dismissed. You know why? I wasn't one of them. I wasn't Trinidadian. I wasn't a part of their culture. I didn't know the nuances of their culture. And so I was always going to be handicapped and disadvantaged. I would never have the platform there that I could have here because I know our culture. I know my people. And it dawned on me in testing that out in the community of faith, I don't need to be a foreign missionary or serving a church in a foreign country because I'm going to be more effective at home. And then I can take my passion for foreign missions and I can put it into sending teams to do short-term mission trips. And that's been my focus. Because God can use my giftedness here, the exact same thing here, more effectively than there. That's testing the call. And that's what we're all... But we have to allow God to interrupt us, to... Speak to us where we are. This isn't just about pastors. This is about all of us. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, how he put it, for all people in the church. He said, we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths, canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. We may pass them by, preoccupied with our more important tasks. When we do that, we pass by the visible sign of the cross raised at our path to show us that not our way, but God's way must be done. Those are strong and helpful words for us, aren't they? Discerning this intersection of God-given passion and the world's great needs, it happens in biblical community. And when you're clear about that, when you're clear about God's call in your life, when you're increasingly clear about your own giftedness and how to exercise it, how to use it, there's a, a God-sized passion that burns in your belly. Catherine of Siena, this wonderful 14th century saint, put it this way. Wonderful quote. She said, If you are what you should be, you will set the world ablaze. Isn't that good? If you are what you should be, you'll set the world ablaze. And it starts with God's calling. God's calling to every one of you. Probably the most magisterial text in all the Bible referring to you, the church, is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Listen to the way he puts it. And just own this for yourself. Own this for yourself. He says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Isn't that good? God called you. God chose you for a God-designed purpose. Not any purpose. Not your purpose. Not my purpose. But God's purpose. You know that the word vocation, we've often used the word vocation to think about what we do for work. You know it comes from the Latin word vocare, which means calling or to call. You see, the, we've reduced it 
to just the job that we do. But the truth is, God has a calling on your life, and your job is just one subset of that. God's calling is a Christian calling for all of us. That includes our jobs. Every arena of life, God has a call to use our gifts. Uh, here's one example. Juan Carlos Ortiz wrote this book called Disciple, and he writes this, putting himself in the shoes of someone, let's say, who works at a Ford factory. And he says this, I don't work at Ford Motor Company to earn my livelihood. I work there because God needs that spot on this earth. He needs one of his own to be there for him. And Mr. Ford happens to support my conquest. It's a way of thinking about God's call on all of your life, not just a segment of your life. All of your life is spiritual. You don't just have a spiritual life and then the rest of your life. God's calling comes alive for you when you discover, develop, and deploy your spiritual gifts. Often we get stuck because maybe we've discovered our gifts, but we really haven't worked on developing them. Or maybe we've discovered and developed them, but we're not really exercising them, deploying them in a particular way. But what God does is He funnels all these gifts. When we do that together, He funnels them together for the common good of the church and the world. The common good, Paul teaches again and again. And the, the church exists for this. The church exists not for itself. The church exists for the world. The church exists so that our gifts might benefit the world. Think of a child going to a birthday party. Now, the birthday child is not the only one who's receiving gifts and having fun, right? Every child who attends that party is going to get a prize, going to join in the fun in the games, going to have some cake. Everyone benefits. That's the model. That's the image that Paul is teaching us about spiritual gifts as we bring them together, merge them together for the common good. What are spiritual gifts? Let me give you a definition. Here's a working definition for you. Spiritual gifts are strengths and abilities with which God endows people to perform specific acts of service. Specific acts of service. In other words, notice, spiritual gifts are not trophies we put on a shelf. They're not plaques we hang on a wall. They're not framed so that we can look back at something and applaud at what was done years before. Spiritual gifts empower the engine to run. They are action. They are acts of service. In fact, the word that Paul uses to refer to God's works and our actions is the same word. He uses it four times in this text. And I want you to tell me what English word you hear in the Greek word. The Greek word is energei. Energei. What, what English word do you hear there? Energy. Energy. Not placidity, energy, action, movement, works. Spiritual gifts move us forward. Spiritual gifts move the, the call of Christ forward, Christ's mission forward. And here's the really good news. Spiritual gifts are not, they're not kooky, they're not weird. They're grounded in the grace of Christ that is the foundation of your life, the foundation of your faith. In fact, the word that's used for grace is in, in the Bible is charis. Charis. Anybody know someone named Charis or Kara? It means grace. You know what the word is for spiritual gifts? Charismata. Charismata. You know what that means? Spiritual gifts are grace gifts. We call them spiritual gifts. They're grace gifts. Out of the grace that God puts in you, that's the fertilizer that allows those gifts to flourish. So the deeper you grow in grace of Jesus Christ in your life, the more your gifts are going to grow and take expression. That means, very literally, every one of you are charismatics. You don't have to be handling snakes and flopping on the floor to be a charismatic because you're all gifted by the Holy Spirit. And these grace gifts again, are for the common good, not just for personal achievement. We, we watched a movie this past week uh, called Divergent. Anybody see Divergent? There's a, a sequel called Insurgent that's coming out. It's a sci-fi movie that is based on this society where everyone is assigned sort of a role. If you are really um, aggressive, you're a part of a kind of a policing force. If you're really compassionate, you're part of this nurturing group. If you are uh, good with nature, you're a part of the farming group. All these groups are segmented off for their entire life, never to mix with one another. And everyone's assigned, based on virtues in their life, a certain faction that they will belong to for the rest of their lives. 
except that, that every so often there's someone who doesn't fit. And that person is what's called divergent. The divergents don't fit neatly in any one of those categories. The leader of this whole movement says, the future belongs to those who know where they belong. And as I, I think about that movie and the model of it, it's interesting that the truth is for us, we are very much, when it comes to our spiritual gifts and where we fit, we're very much like that. We, we all have a unique place where we belong, yet we are also all divergent. Why do I say that? Because we pull all of our gifts, not just for a certain faction to benefit, not just for our own personal benefit, but for the common good, for all to benefit. And when we all benefit, it overflows into the world. That's the way God designed the church. Spiritual gifts benefit the community of faith, and they're born in the community of faith. And then others benefit as a result. It's here that you discover, develop, and deploy your spiritual gifts. And so we need one another. We need feedback, just like I needed it when I was in Trinidad. We need one another for the full expression of our gifts so that we can operate with maximum capacity in our giftedness. We merge these so that God can work powerfully in us. You know, you can see a model for this if you are a NASCAR fan or IndyCar fan. When those guys drive into the pit, what happens? There's a crew waiting for them, and they are all working in precision on their unique roles, right? Unique jobs, but all at the same time in coordination with one another. Back in 1950, when the Indy cars began, they had four men. And it took 60 seconds, 60 seconds for them to do the changeover. Can you, that's like an eternity in race car driving today. Today, there are 11 men in Indy car races, and it takes eight seconds. That's what happens when all of the giftedness, everybody plays their role and comes together for maximum effectiveness. So you have a role. God has designed you and me for that. Nothing beats the body of Christ when, it, when it, the gifts of God are merged together and functioning in harmony. That includes every single one of us. So that's why speaking for the staff, we're so grateful. I'm so grateful for you and for your volunteer time. When I look back at the last year and all the things that you all have done and been involved with, the ministries you've nurtured, the people you've touched, the way that God has used you, that's why we're celebrating with a volunteer appreciation banquet. Not just to applaud you, but to applaud how God is using you to bring redemption and restoration and hope and love and peace and grace in people's lives. And, and it gives us so much hope about the coming year. That's what we're celebrating as we come together next Sunday night. You see, we advance God's mission. And God's kingdom comes alive to us when we all put spiritual gifts to action. When it all happens together. Now Paul gives us a gift list. And we're not going to go through these in much detail, but real briefly I want to mention, when we take all of the chapters that mention these gifts, this is the list that we come up with. Wisdom. Now wisdom is sort of discernment, good judgment. We need people with good judgment in the life of the church. And then he talks about knowledge, which is more about heart knowledge than head knowledge because wisdom kind of covers the head part. Then there's the gift of faith. Some people have, not everyone is called to faith, but some people have an exceptional ability to trust. I know people here like that. People who are an inspiration to me because of their faith. They have the gift of faith. My own wife has that gift. There's the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, which is not kooky, it's deeds of power. Sometimes it's very naturally explained. There's the gift of prophecy that he mentions, which is merely proclamation. It's forth-telling, not foretelling. There's the gift of discernment, knowing good from evil. We need people who know they have that gift, don't we? There's the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. It does mention that. That does happen. There's the gift of servanthood. Many people have that gift. A lot, a lot of moms have that gift. Because they know what it's like to serve their families in such selfless ways. There's the gift of teaching. 
The gift of administration. You're actually using a lot of these gifts in other arenas of your life. You have used them. But guess what? They can be more well developed in the life and in the context of the church. There's the gift of generosity. Did you know that was a spiritual gift? Generosity of time. Generosity of one's resources. Generosity in one's presence. There is the gift of shepherding. That is kind of a nurturing leadership. The gift of compassion. You can look at people who are involved in compassionate ministries and almost across the board, they would score as having the gift, the spiritual gift, the grace gift of compassion. There's the gift of helping, forms of assistance, the gift of evangelism, which you know, we're all called to share our faith, but some people have an exceptional ability to share the faith. That's a spiritual gift. The gift of visionary leadership. All these are gifts. All Christians are given one or more. You are called to exercise one or more of these gifts. And listen, I want you to hear this invitation from me to each and every one of you. If you have confusion or questions or want help with that discovery, let me know. Let me know. Because that's why I'm here. Not to do it for you, but to equip you, empower you, walk with you assist you so that we all might benefit and Christ's kingdom is built through our collective efforts. This is not haphazard. This isn't something that's willy-nilly that we just kind of slide into, but it takes wisdom and discernment to know God's call and God's giftedness in our lives. I'm reminded of the guy who, who died and he was, he was standing before Peter at the pearly gates. And before he would enter, Peter said, well, have you done anything virtuous in your life that would warrant your uh, being here? And he said, well, yes, I did. There, one time there was a woman who, she was being picked on by a big group of, big kind of, you know, Hell's Angels bikers. And I went up to the biggest, baddest, meanest guy. He was all tatted up, and he had this big Harley. I kicked over his Harley. I poked him in the chest. And I said, listen here, buddy. You stop messing with her. You're going to have to answer to me. And Peter said to him, well, when exactly did that happen? He said, oh, a couple minutes ago. <laughs> There's a big difference between faith and foolishness. It takes discernment. It takes wisdom. It takes weeding it out together. That's why you need biblical community. That's why we need one another on a regular basis to get clarity, to discover, develop, and deploy our gifts. God gave you gifts not to ignore, not to underuse them. Sometimes we have people that overuse and those that underuse, sort of the 80-20 rule. When you underuse, you're underdeveloping yourself spiritually. There's an interesting analogy to this in the airline industry. I read about how ever since airliners, commercial airliners especially, went to all the, automa the autopilots, that you know, pilots basically will, will, will take off and land the plane, but everything in between is done by autopilots. And so they talk about how pilots experience what's called skill fade or skill decay. Let me have you raise your hands. How many of you would like to ride on a commercial jet with pilots that are experiencing skill fade? or skill decay. Any takers? Any takers? Yeah, one liar back there. Wise guy. There's always one. Um, of course not. Of course not. God's church does not take off, does not take flight with gift fade, gift decay. It takes all of us engaged from A to Z in our own walk, learning our gifts, using our gifts. God gave you gifts to immerse yourself in their use, in their development. Interesting research was done with a group of artists. 200 artists were interviewed that graduated from an art school to see the causes for why some of them left the art trade and some of them stayed. Interesting conclusion. By and large, all those that left art, be it painting or other forms of art, were ones who were very much concerned about the value of their art, how they would sell their art, the price they would put on their art, and how they would succeed in their art, they ended up fading away. Those that stayed, were committed, they were the ones that simply loved art. You see, creative achievements depend on single-minded immersion. And that's what they had. It didn't matter what else was going on. Jesus died... Jesus died to give you gifts so that you might have single-minded immersion, so that 
those gifts might come alive in you and through us so that you and I might set the world ablaze. Thanks be to him for that gift. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you have thought of it all. Help us come alive to what you're doing. Help us to take flight in such a way that this year would be a year of new discoveries, of new life, of your spirit inhabiting us and taking expression through us as never before so that your world might benefit, so that your mission might be accomplished, and so that you might receive all the honor and glory and praise. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to respond to God's grace with the singing of our middle hymn. Please bow with me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your wonder and grace revealed to us, undeserving. Yet because of your love, not ours, we can find our way to you. We ask you this morning, Heavenly Father, to allow us to come before your throne to receive of your love and mercy. We're blessed by being in your very presence. That alone is all we need. Yet in your abundance of love, you tell us that we can ask for things of you. It is from that place that we make our needs for others known to you. This morning, Lord, we pray for John Fuchs. We pray for Mary Lane. We pray for Wanda McCartney. We pray for Hap Harrington. We pray for Susan Powell. We pray for Charles Grubb. We pray for, continue to pray for Janice Pigeon in our midst this morning. We pray for Leah Fox. And we pray for Norman Fox, Lord. Father, we also pray for those whose needs are all known by you, even though they're not expressed here this morning. We pray, Lord, for our missionaries, Barbara and Ken in Haiti. We pray for our church. We pray for our leaders. We pray for all of us, Lord, together who, who love you and, and need you, Lord. And now we praise you, Lord God, for your Son and you, Father, and your Holy Spirit. You alone are worthy of our praise. Your majesty is declared throughout the world through your works. We offer to you now a token of our unity in spirit by saying together the prayer that you, Lord Jesus, taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.